people have also asked me in the comment section how my solar upgrade actually goes. Well, as you know, we upgraded recently the west roof here, completely filled the whole roof with solar panels. And I've got like 3.1, 3.2 kilowatts now on this side of the garage. And I want to show you the, the difference it makes actually here. Here in this section, you can see the east roof and the west roof in comparison. 133 watts from the east roof and 322 from the west roof. Um, we still have shading on the whole roof here. The sun is just coming around the trees now, but both sides of the garage are still shaded. And um, well, you can see there's almost twice as much power coming from the west roof now as we have from the east roof. While before it was almost the same, the west side of the roof here was always a bit more powerful because we have slightly higher powered uh, solar panels there. But this was more like 10-15% more I got out of the west roof, but now it is more than twice as much as we get from the east roof here. So this upgrade has really, really made a difference. So yeah, here you can see the situation now. It is around 11 o'clock. It's a bit windy up here. And shading, 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 basically. There's a bit of sun here on these panels. But as we can see, we've got more than double the power output here from this side than on the other side. Yeah, here as well, shading, a bit of sun here. That's the situation. So we're getting 350 watts out of this side already now. So if we upgrade this side here as well, we will get around 700 watts of both sides in pure shading. And this is exactly one of the goals I wanted to achieve here. I said 1000 watts under shading conditions is my goal. So we've got this side of the roof here as well, which we want to upgrade at some stage. But yeah, so far this, um, these two strings here make a huge difference already. Well, you can never have enough solar, right? <laughs> we are in the middle of a climate and energy crisis. Why wouldn't you put more solar panels up? I don't mind changing the position of these solar panels here all the time to charge the Blue Eti. With these two small panels, it takes about four days to fully charge the Blue Eti. And then I can connect my water pump on the house for over 24 hours. So I'm saving roughly 25% of my energy bill just with the Blue Eti and connecting it to my water pump at the house. I, I change the position several times a day when I'm at home here to charge it up as quick as possible. But these are only 240 watt panels connected to it. But I have planned to start a little side project actually for exactly this purpose to supply power to this water pump at the house. So stay tuned for that. It could be an inspiration for many of us. Good morning everyone and welcome back to another video here from the Offkit Garage. It is still winter but it's nice and warm. T-shirt weather. Well this morning I want to have a look at the temperature sensor here T1. As you have seen it shows almost 80 degrees and it constantly mucks up my settings and stops discharging and charging of the battery. Because it thinks something is hot in here but it's really not 80 degrees. Definitely not. And most of the time it shows just a few degrees over the other temperature sensors. But you can see, here you can see, it is always that jumpy. See the other ones, they are fairly constant, right? But this one here at the top, it's, it's jumping up and down as if it is badly connected or so. And here temperature sensor number two, if I hold this for a moment, you can see the temperature going up. See there, it's rising. But this one here, number one, shows us 70 degrees now. Whoa, they are cold in here. 13 degrees only, hey? This is number three. Yeah, the order of the temperature sensor. Um, this is T1, T2, T3 and T4. We want to have a look and measure the resistance of that. So I'm turning off the... BMS. 
disconnecting the battery okay. and we can safely probably somehow get in here oh yeah here we go there's a little clip you need to press to get these cables off the bms and now you've got all these beautiful wonderful cables here so this is the main negative here, the black one on one side. And then we've got the first battery, second battery, third, fourth, and so on. But see the two black ones in between here? This is the first temperature sensor. And you can also see there are another pair of black cables here at the end. This is the temperature sensor number two. So this refers to this PCB here. So temperature sensor number one and sensor number two. Where do you look here? Sensor number two on this side. And then we've got the same on the other side with two black pairs of wires here in these balance cables. Okay, let's see if I can measure the resistance. I, I got in contact with Zeplos and they sent me the instructions. And they said um, it should have 10 kilo ohms at 25 degrees. So um, we are at 13.14, 13 13.12. 13 what? This is the resistance of temperature sensor number one. See how jumpy it is? And that's why the display is totally freaking out and shows us 70 something. Oh, here we go. Two kilo ohms only. The resistance is changing from 10 to two. And if I measure the other temperature sensor at the end, it's a constant resistance. It's not jumpy. 16.55. Kilo ohms. And here, this is the faulty one again. Yeah, it's jumping up and down. It's definitely faulty. Oh, there we go. Again, 1.8 kilo ohms only. Ooh. It's a classic warranty case. And these are classical NTC thermistors. So that means the higher the temperature, the lower the resistance is. And I can show you that here. If we measure the one which is working at the end of the PCB, we've got a resistance of 16, can you see that? 16.3 kilo ohms. And if I touch the resistor now, if I touch the thermistor and warm it up a little bit, you can see the resistance is going down slowly. 15.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. This is a classical example for an NTC. NTC means negative temperature coefficient. So the higher the temperature, the lower the resistance. And this is why the the um, this is why the faulty one shows us only two kilo ohms sometimes, and then 80 degrees on the actual display. All right, we just have to wait for the replacement the thermistor coming in, and then we uh, solder this on the PCB here and replace this faulty part. No big deal can happen and then yesterday because it was such a rainy day yesterday uh, I tried to establish the communication RS485 to the Victron system to the computer with some gear I already had um, I've got this very old USB RS485 converter I found in my box and it comes with this um, connector terminals here and I connected everything up um, the converter shows up on the computer and on the Raspberry Pi, so it is being recognized. The drivers are installed, but it doesn't show anything in the VRM or in Venus OS or even on the computer. I followed all the instructions in the manual and made my own LAN cable here with this um, ground A and B cable, connected them to the converter, plugged this one into the computer, but even the standard software coming with the Sepplow system um, didn't pick up any signals from this converter. So it might be faulty. It is, it is like 15, 15 years old or something. And I couldn't establish any communication at all. I have also tried to hook up the JKBMS. We are the, uh, here, we are the RS485 adapter. Connected this all to the same adapter, connected it to the VRM, installed all the drivers and everything, but it doesn't pick anything up. So it might be either faulty or the drivers are not working correctly. Um, last night I have ordered a whole bunch of 
converters USB to RS485. And I will test several of these to give you an option what you can buy. They're all not very expensive, but I thought better order some more and test them out. So you don't have to test it and see what is actually working and what not. So this will all come in the next couple of weeks. We will see if we can hook up the JKBMS here to the Venus OS and see all the information in the VRM. Yeah, and um, this is actually on Raspberry Pi 3, 3B plus or something. One of my viewers sent me because I cannot get any Raspberry Pis worldwide. I've got two still on order, but they're not coming in. They are on back order for months now. I probably cancel the whole order. They're not coming in. Chip shortage everywhere, no Raspberry Pis anymore. And I'm also in contact with some of my viewers here to discuss this whole communication protocol, this whole communication setup for the um, Seplos BMSs. And thank you so much for all your information and the good tips. And I try to bring this all together here on the channel then in one video to give everyone an overview of what is actually working and whatnot. And at the moment, it looks like only the CAN bus here, only the CAN bus connection can communicate with the Victron systems, either directly with the inverter, but this is not what I want. I don't want to have the BMS talking to the inverter directly. I want to have the BMS talking to the whole system and then control, you know, solar charge controllers, control the charging current of these controllers into the battery. This is what we want to achieve. This is the main purpose of connecting a BMS to your, to your solar system. But at the moment, it looks like communication between the Seplos BMSs and the Venus OS cannot be established. And then, guys, as a further very exciting update, um, this week I have contracted an electrician to come in and have a look at the whole system here, at the battery packs, at our power wall, and at the installation of our solar panels on the roof. Oh boy, I tell you, it took me weeks to get one which has actually the knowledge of all that. Especially here in the rural areas, it is not easy to find an electrician who has actually some knowledge of battery technology, inverters, solar, DC charging. Most of them, they do just residential and industrial installations. They do a bit of solar here and there, but this is all grid tight solar, but off grid, almost nothing. And I saw these vehicles driving around here for a while now, and they always have these off-grid advertising on the side. And I said, well, let's try these ones. Let's give them a call and ask them if they are happy to come out and have a look at the safety and compliance of my whole system here. And yeah, it turned out they are actually not too far away from here. So this will happen next week. I'm not sure if I film anything, but I certainly will keep you up to date what they are saying what we have to change, what they have to change to make it all compliant with the um, current standard and code and everything. I also need them to have a look at my solar on the roof here because I think uh, there's, there's a major problem. Um, let me show you. All right, so, oh, look at these spider webs here. Jeez, they love it underneath here, hot and dry. Okay, as you know, I've done the um, uh, installation recently here for my earth cable and put this um, conduit in here with all these settles and clicked this all in. And I could see this See these, um, these white lines here, where the sun is coming through? Let me show you this a little bit closer. Here you can see it. Look at this. You can see my finger on the top. The, the lamination of the back of these panels here is cracking. And I was always wondering why these bus bars here are getting so dark sometimes. See, sometimes they are really shiny here and then they are getting dark. And I think this is moisture. There has been moisture inside the panels. I couldn't see any condensation or something, any damage at all from the top here, but you can clearly see the cracking here. See this in between, the white stuff? There. And this is happening for this string 
and this string of the um, Canadian solar solar panels. Well, these ones here, they are totally fine. Look, there's no cracking and there's no oxidation. There's no discoloration of the bus bars, nothing. They are totally perfectly fine. But these ones crack all the way through. This one here, all the way, this one all the way. And at the beginning, I didn't realize what it actually is. But you can see it clearly there. This is actually, yes, there's some, um, there's sunlight coming through. Look at this. This is not good. This is not good. So um, I've freaked really out and I'm really glad the electrician is coming in next week <laughs> to have a look at this shit. Yeah, we've got, got another one here. This is one of the Canadian solars as well. And uh, you can see the discoloration here on the bus bar. See that? Yeah. This one is not too bad. Oh yeah, it's here. It's bad here. See, you can see where it starts. It's not as bad as the ones on the roof. But here you can see the cracking. You can see the cracks. There it's okay. And then it cracks down further here. And there it starts. Here the whole line is cracked. And now the problem comes. If I take off... You know, these are the solar panels we picked up recently. This was the last... Yeah, this was the last pickup we did in Brisbane here, the two kilowatt system. And these are all 60 cell panels. So six by 10, 60, 60 cell panels, which have around 30 volts of nominal voltage here. And because of the setup on the roof, I can only use these panels at the moment here. You cannot have one string with 60 cell panels and then the next string with 72 uh, cell panels because they have a higher voltage. They are around 40, 45 volts already. And you cannot have them in parallel on one controller. Yeah, see the difference there? This is a 60 cell panel, six by 10, and this is six by 12. 72 panels, 72 cells, 45 volts, 30 volts. So you should not mix different kind of solar panels in one string or in even in parallel strings on one controller. And I don't know, from here on we have different scenarios how this all could go now. And at the moment I have just enough panels to cover the whole garage with these 60 cell panels here. West roof here fully filled with these panels and I was planning to do the same on the other side. Now with these two strings obviously failing very soon, well, this, is a, this is a safety concern now with the cracks underneath. I can of course take these um, faulty panels off and replace them with the ones we've picked up. But then I would have nothing for this area here. And 60 panels, 60 cell panels, you won't get them anymore these days. They are all at least 72 cell panels, 144 if you have half cut or even the larger ones when you have triple cut panels now. So I'm not sure. I have discovered this quite a while back and I left it as it is because I knew the electrician would come in at some stage anyway to have a look. So we will see what we are going to do, but um, potentially we are taking off the whole panels on the east roof altogether and replace them with something new. But again, this is something this is something I would like to discuss with the electrician first and see what their suggestion is, because they've got all the experience with um, shading conditions, what kind of solar panels we could use for this purpose. So we may need to do some changes here on the roof as well. I guess it will be a very interesting and potentially expensive week. Okay, guys, so far this update video here from Sunday morning on top of the off-grid garage. As always, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for all your amazing support here on the channel. I'm receiving an increased amount of emails again. I'm totally, I'm totally unable to respond to all of them. I'm trying to catch up as much as possible, but um, better leave your comments down under the videos. And until the next video, guys, you stay charged, stay safe, and thanks again so much for watching. See you then. Bye-bye. It never ends.